Electric violin shop. How we all doing today? It's Wednesday, um, and again, I'm not in front of the violin wall. Uh, we're actually a functioning uh, retail establishment, and we got somebody in there right now trying out some electric cellos, which is very cool. So you may hear some of that background. You may hear like some right, some lots of cello stuff. That's what cello players do. All right. That goes out to Shauna, our staff cellist, where I was giving each other trouble about that sort of thing. So this week we are talking about why you might want to go with an electric violin. I, would, I just got back from the ASTA conference, the American String Teachers Association in Orlando, Florida. It was wonderful. It was amazing. Over 1,200 string teachers in there, and we're sort of trying to, um, those of us weirdos, the electric weirdos, out there trying to educate the educators about what an amazing instrument this is. Uh, it turns out that the the headline concert, which was arranged by uh, Jesus Florido, who's an amazing string player out of Los Angeles, it was Jesus Florido and friends. So Jesus Florido, um, Mark Wood, Tracy Silverman, Martha Mook, um, who else played? Uh, Joe Denizon. Greg Byers, all of those guys were playing with Al Di Miola's band back him up. It was, oh, it was glorious. It was so wonderful. And uh, Mark O'Connor and Maggie O'Connor got up and played. And Vi Wickham got up and played. Rob Janoff, who's here, he was there. Just all these amazing, amazing players sort of showing the world what you can do with amplified strings, right? So it was really fun. I got to sit in on a bunch of classes. I got to help teach a couple of classes, did some work with Rob Janoff. And... Um, and one of the things that really, um, really sort of struck me is with 1,200 people with all, you know, like music degrees, people that are professional educators in the string world, how little most of them know about electric instruments. They really, most of them really know almost nothing about electric instruments. So I think that's maybe where we're failing as educators. Um, I don't know if you'd ever trust your kid to somebody who looks like me, but um, yeah, as educators, we're not doing a good job of educating the educators about these instruments and electric instruments and why they are legit and why they're valuable and why anybody would want one of these things, right? So the first thing that I want to cover on that is electric violin is a legitimate instrument. And it seems really, really silly to say that. I've been making my living by playing one for over 20 years. Um, the IRS thinks my violin's legitimate, believe me. Um, but there, there is a class of people that are sort of the nothing good has happened since 1800 crowd that, that they don't view these as legitimate instruments. This is a, this is a gimmick. It's a, it's a prop. It's a toy. They sort of pat you on the head and go, oh, it's, I bet what you're doing is so fun. I bet it's fun. Can you play Baby Shark? There's there's a there's an there's an element of the string you know, some fun stuff right right you can play that on electric it's cute and it's fun um, there are Rachel Barton Pine probably one of the top ten living violinists is an electric violinist Maxime Vengeroff arguably the greatest living violinist plays electric violin. There are so many incredible, amazing players. All the guys that I mentioned in that concert, they were they were the best violinists in the room and they were playing on electric instruments. It's a legitimate instrument. It's um it's 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 a similar to an acoustic violin, but different in the same way that electric guitar and acoustic guitar are similar but different. I mean, I don't know how many people would say, well, the acoustic guitar is a legitimate instrument, but the electric guitar, it's a gimmick. It's it's fun. You can play simple little, you can play simple little kids songs on it, and it'll be ha ha ha, so cute. Um, there's real art and real music being played on these instruments by real players, 
and there are there are amazing um, pieces of music being written for these instruments. Okay, so it's a legitimate instrument. I can't believe I have to say that, but I have to say that. Um, let's talk about evolution. Let's go back and and uh, I got to sit in a class with Rudolf Hocken, who's a professor at the University of Illinois. Um, and you can actually get a degree in electric violin at the University of Illinois. Go Illini. I'll say that as a Spartan. Um, he goes back and looks at the history. We look at Baroque violins. They actually changed the design of the instrument to go from the Baroque period to the classical period because they were building larger and larger concert halls to accommodate a growing population and a growing um, uh, amount of money. Chuck Bontrager, what's up, man? Um, people were able to afford to go see concerts, and so they're building larger concert halls. The problem is, violins are not very loud. So if you want to play a violin for 50 people, you can do that. You want to play a violin for 500 people? A little harder, right? Everybody's got to be really quiet, and they're having to listen hard, and nobody better cough, right? So the reason that we started getting larger and larger ensembles when the modern orchestra, where they've got 20 first violins, it's not because they really like the sound of 20 violins playing together. It's because one violin isn't loud enough. So they didn't have amplification at the time. They could actually make some louder instruments, a little bit louder, but they had to, the best, the easiest way for them was to just add more violins. That's how you make an orchestra louder. So. In today's world, we've got concert halls and stadiums and, you know, you're playing in front of 50 to 100,000 people. You can either have a thousand violinists standing down there or you can amplify one of them. Okay, so it's a lot cheaper to hire one and amplify them than it is to hire a thousand violinists. And lest you think that I don't want violinists to be employed, of course, I'd like to see a thousand violinists working. However, it's really hard for a thousand violinists to play together unless they're playing a sh some music that's been pre-written, right? So if we want some improvisation, and we want improvisation, because, you know, hey, Paganini's great, but everybody's played it, right? So uh, heard it a thousand times, hearing it a thousand and one, okay. Um, if you want original music, if you want original, interesting, oh, Facebook almost fell down. Sorry, Facebook. Um, Get you prop back up. Well, again. All right, mean old Mr. Gravity. All right, if you want original music, you want improvised music, you want stuff that's in the moment and 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 fresh, then you gotta have improvisation. And you can't have a thousand violinists trying to improv all at once. It sounds like tackle football. So, in order to play for larger and larger and larger crowds, volume is one reason that you would want an electric violin. If you're playing for a large crowd and you need to be amplified so that a thousand people can hear you. And if you're, uh, you know, the room that we played in, um, in Orlando last week, there were several hundred people in there and they're all cheering their full heads off because Mark Wood's up on stage throwing down. Um, and so he had to be amplified or nobody's gonna be able to hear him, right? So volume is one great reason. Get loud, get paid. That's how we're doing this, right? Ergonomics is another reason. You may notice I haven't had to hold this violin like this at all. Both my hands are free. Hey, Facebook, both hands are free. The violin's still out there, right? It's good, it's fun. Um, the violin, playing, the, playing an acoustic violin is an ergonomic nightmare, right? Anybody who studies ergonomics would look at an acoustic violin and go, you've lost your ever-living mind. Who can? That is not a natural thing to do at all. In fact, uh, I was talking to Rob Janoff, who's here, and Rob has actually done some work in the movie business where he'll have to coach an actor who doesn't play the violin how to look like he's playing the violin. Can you imagine, like, trying to teach somebody who doesn't play to look like they're playing? Like, this, this motion that we do, it's the right hand alone. I mean, it takes years to learn that, right? So Rob's got to teach a guy in, like, an hour how to play this thing, right? Electric weirdo. Um, so it, ergonomically, it's insanely crazy to play an acoustic violin. So many players get hurt playing the violin. That, man, I, I'm on the Violin Guild and all these different um, forums on, on Facebook and Instagram, and 
So many people are like, oh, I got neck injuries, I've got back injuries, I've got shoulder problems from playing the violin. It is an ergonomic nightmare. The nice thing about an electric violin is we can design around that. The shape of an acoustic violin is more or less set, right? Because we, we're relying on this wooden body to amplify the sound. The shape, more or less, we gotta live with this, okay? So you're gonna have to hold it a certain way, getting in high positions, you're cranking around and doing all this weird stuff. With an electric, you don't have to do that. We don't have to have a body. We can access all the high positions. <laughs> really a lot easier. I don't have to hold this thing with my head, especially if I'm a singer. Um, so electric violins can have chest supports and, and straps and um, a lot of different things. The other thing, not just the wood violin, um, ergonomically is a far superior instrument, um, but any of the others. Uh, NS Design has some really cool ergonomic designs. Uh, Jordan right here. All It's not just about how heavy the instrument is, it's where the weight is. With an acoustic violin, your center of mass is way out here. With an electric violin, we can put the center of mass much, much further back because we don't need a body out here. This is a six string violin that by itself is actually heavier than acoustic, but because all the weight's back here, I'm not holding it in my hand. It's not putting pressure on my shoulders, not putting pressure into any of these little delicate structures in here that if I play for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours uh, are gonna have repetitive strain injuries. So volume is a great reason to go electric. Ergonomics is a is a fantastic reason to go electric. Electric violin luthries here, yeah. They, uh, they make fantastic violins that are super, super lightweight. All the weight is back here and um, much more ergonomic. You're much less likely to get hurt playing that instrument, okay? Um, I've got notes here. Yes. Okay. Volume. When we talked about the fact that an electric violin can get way loud, woohoo, rock and roll, um, they can also get much, much quieter than an acoustic violin. And that's a really cool thing. A, I just bid a job today, um, actually for a dinner party somewhere, and it's going to be a small dinner party at somebody's house. Well, the problem is an acoustic violin is just going to make a certain amount of sound no matter what you do. If you're playing it, you can only get so quiet with that instrument. And electric, on the other hand, like nobody can hear that. If I'm playing and there's a room where eight or 10 people are talking, they're not gonna hear that unless I amplify. So maybe next week we'll do that. Um, so the, um, it's, the nice thing about electric is it's much quieter, right? I can practice them and I'm not gonna bother anybody who's sleeping in my house or my apartment or next door. Um, so the electric filing is great for that. It's also great in a live setting because it is so much quieter. Let's demonstrate some effects that you can use with an electric filing that you might have some issues with in acoustic. You know, we've got this cool organ sound, right? want to use this cool organ sound or if I want to do some pitch shifting right if I'm playing in a small venue where people will be able to hear my instrument and be able to hear the amp what happens if I'm trying to play this instrument <laughs> that's funny um, this instrument's actually acoustically and electrically louder than that one I'm so used to playing a five string, I was reaching for the C and it isn't there. That's really strange. Um, so in, a, in a, an acoustic instrument, if I'm trying to run effects on it, especially pitch shifting or some delay effects or whatever, the instrument is loud enough that you can hear the instrument and you can hear the effect. That's not always ideal, right? Especially if it's pitch shifting. You know, if I'm doing a thing where I'm using a, uh, say a half step down, um, I'm actually playing with a band this weekend 
that they do about half of their tunes um, with the guitars tune in E flat and the other half of their tunes with a capo on the first fret. So, or E flat. Or I can bring two violins, one tuned to A440 and the other one tuned to uh, A sharp 440, down half a step. Or I can just use a drop pedal, which is a, uh, which is a pedal that um, electronically shifts my pitch down a half a step. Because in country music, you're losing out, using a lot of open strings and drags and all that. And I, I can play it all in A flat, but that sucks. Who wants to do that? So um, with an acoustic instrument, the instrument be loud enough that if I'm pitch shifting, that's no bueno. So a solid body electric, because it's so much quieter, it gives you more options on, um, on effects that you can use. Okay? So... Volume getting loud, you can get much louder with an electric than you can with acoustic. Ergonomics are better. Uh, the fact that I can get much quieter than I can with an acoustic. Some effects. Um, actually, when I was sitting in Rudolf Hawkins' um, seminar this week, uh, he's, he's the one who's the professor at the University of Illinois. He had some of his students there, and they're fantastic, fantastic players. Uh, no, it's not audio to MIDI. That's just the, uh, the electroharmonic C9 pedal. Um, he's got some fantastic players, guys that are studying to get their degree in music. And one of the guys made a really cool comment that I had not thought of before. Um, he said, when you're playing an acoustic, you're, you're playing in the room, but the room's really playing you, right? So if, if you're playing in a super, super dry room, then the violin's gonna sound really dry if it's just an acoustic violin. If you're playing in a room that's got sort of a wonky EQ to the room, like there's a weird sort of resonance in that room, the room's playing you. If you're playing an electric, you can add reverb if you're playing in a super dry room. And actually more and more modern rooms are being made really, really dry. They're putting in carpet and they're putting in padded chairs and humans are getting bigger and bigger because humans are getting bigger and bigger. So I, us sound guys, we call them a bunch of meat sacks. Look at all these meat sacks in here. They're soaking up all this sound. So rooms are getting drier and drier. I can add reverb to the violin to make it sound like you're in a concert hall. We're having a concert hall experience without having to have a conversation. So rather than letting the room play you, you get to play in the room because with an electric violin, thing that's that's doing us sound guys are getting bigger and bigger hopefully actually right now with the coronavirus so many of us are out of work we're all going to get skinny again you'll be able to tell who the gigging musicians are because about two months from now they're all going to be really thin um which sucks i hope you guys are all doing okay i've had some gigs canceled and some trips canceled and uh i hope you guys aren't getting beat up too bad with this thing um we are getting uglier too chuck thanks for pointing that out um so you don't have to let the room play you. If you've got an electric, you can affect your sound in a way that allows you to play to the room, um, which allows you to sound better. So a lot of people think, well, electric violins, they don't sound as good as acoustic. Well, they can sound a whole lot better than acoustics, depending what kind of room you're in, and you can make adjustments that acoustic violins cannot make, okay? The other thing is extended range. Speaking of Chuck Bontrager, one of the great extended range violin players in the world. Throughout history, it's not like making six and seven string instruments. It's not like that's a new thing. We've, we've known about extended range instruments for centuries. They, they've tried to make them. The problem is if you're counting on this little wooden box to be your amplifier, they're just not really a good way to do it. So they tried to make six and seven string violins that will project big into a room. And, and guys like Eric Cedar are still making six string acoustic violins, but those things really sound like money as when you plug them in, okay? So extended range instruments, this is a six string Jordan here. buddy that's right i know why this thing was so quiet it was turned way down what's wrong with me you don't turn violins down you only turn them up crazy talk so extended range instruments five we actually sell more five string violins than six than fours 
six string, seven string, even eight string. And I think um, John Jordan actually made a nine string one time because he can. Um, historically, those don't work well in unamplified environments. So why go electric? Because extended range is so much easier to do with an electric than it is with an acoustic. Why would I want extended range? Well, because more is better. Less is more. It's ridiculous. More is more. Um, so why would I want extended range? Well, there's a lot of literature now being written for extended range instruments. Tracy Silverman is writing six string concertos. Joe Denison's writing stuff. Martha Mook is writing stuff for, um, for uh, extended range instruments. There's a lot of great literature being written for extended range instruments, if you want to get into that. Um, improvisation, the more range I got, the more choices I got. And choices are good. Okay. Also, if I have a five string instrument, I can take violin and viola gigs with the same instrument. I can play a viola chair or a violin chair, um, and it increases my chances of getting paid. And getting paid is good. Um, it's, it's also, it allows us to chase after more stuff. Guys that are writing amazing music like Chuck Bontrager. Um, they can, the more range the instrument has, the more the uh, composer or the songwriter, the more his options open up, okay? Um, the wow factor. Let's talk about this. How cool is this? This is a beautiful instrument, right? People see that and they go, man, you know, I've seen a thousand violins, but what the heck is that? People listen with their eyes. And I know we can talk about purity and blah, blah, blah. But even like the hardcore classical folks, they know that people listen with their eyes. You know how I know this? Because they have really strict dress codes for orchestras. You can't just walk on an orchestra stage wearing a mini skirt and a bra. Even if you're a guy, they will not be happy about that. So it's because they know people are listening with their eyes. So they have, you know, you do your hair before you go play. What's up, Steven? You do your hair before you go play, you'll think about what outfit you're going to wear to be on stage. You're thinking about the lighting on stage, camera angles. Why not think about what your instrument looks like? I mean, the thing that everybody's looking at, the thing that's making sound, it can be cool looking, right? Which attracts people. Maybe someone who's kind of walking by and they're yeah, maybe half listening to what you're doing, but oh my goodness, what on earth are they holding? you got gotten their attention. It gives you one more chance to get somebody's attention to um, to maybe let them listen to what you're doing. So um, let's talk about the reasons again. Why would you go to electric? You can get louder than an acoustic. You can get quieter than an acoustic. The ergonomics are far better on many electric violins than they are an acoustic violin. You're less likely to hurt yourself by playing for hours and hours and hours. You can use a lot of different effects to reverb, to, to wetten up a dry room. You can use delay to fatten up your sound. You can use tiny bits of distortion to warm up your sound. Chorus and detune can spread your sound and make it sound like there's more of you. If you play out of tune, it sounds like there's more of you too. Okay. There's just so many different ways that you can change your sound. Modern music is gonna require you to make a lot of different sounds. The more different sounds you can make, the more gigs you can take, the more money you can make and the bigger house you can buy to put all your violins in it. Um, so effects, extended range. You can start exploring more extended range stuff with electric instruments. It's a wow factor. People listen with their eyes. So all these are great reasons to switch to electric. If you are a teacher and you want to be teaching in your classroom, if you've got a five string violin and an octave pedal, you can cover violin, viola, and cello parts for your kids with only one instrument. If you've got a six or a seven string violin, you can do the same thing. Violin, viola, cello parts with one instrument. How nice would it be to be able to show the cello kids, hey, this is what I want to hear. Right, instead of trying to like sing it to them, you can show them. Excuse me, must have been the tacos. Um, so it's just, there's so many reasons to switch to an electric violin. And I wouldn't even say switch. I would say add an electric violin to your arsenal. Most of, most of us who play electric also have acoustic violins. I hardly ever play mine for money. I practice it a lot, but 99% um, of my paid gigs are on an electric. Um, but I'm not, I'm not saying electric instead of acoustic. It's usually in addition to. 
do because they're both legitimate instruments. They're both with legitimate purposes. Um, and so electrics are good for teaching. They're good for performing. They're good for practicing. There's a lot of reasons to have one. Okay. I also, while we're here, I want to address a myth that I've seen a lot of times on internet forums. Well, believe it or not, there are people saying stuff on the internet that is not true. Sorry, it's, it's accurate. Um, you'll hear people say that electric violins are easier to play because you don't have to produce tone. That is total horse crap. Totally, totally wrong. When they say, the people who say, and it's funny because the people who say that, electric violin, and they either don't have any videos of them playing electric violin or their electric violin sounds, it sounds bad because they don't know how to play it. So the people who say electric violin is easy because you don't have to produce tone, it is a lie. It is completely and utterly untrue. It's not an opinion, it's a fact. You do have to produce tone with an electric violin. It's a little different than producing tone on an acoustic violin. No, I don't have to dig into my strings as hard to beat the tone out of that thing. I play pretty much on top of the string all the time. I have an amplifier. If I wanna get loud, I'll just turn a knob, okay? I can get loud enough to run you out of this county without ever having to work very hard. Why y'all wanna work that hard? So producing tone on electric is a little different than producing tone on an acoustic. The electric, people say the electric's more forgiving, that you can lay back and it's, it's more forgiving. You do actually need to lay back, that part is true. But the part about it being forgiving, more forgiving is utterly untrue. You'll find that electrics, any little tiny noise that you make gets amplified, right? If I set my bow down on the strings, like you all heard that. If it's done with an acoustic, you're not gonna hear that. You know, if I'm up on stage, I wanna check my, my tuning before I start, right? I'm gonna... You've all done it. Don't don't snicker, you've all done it. Before you're gonna play, you know, before you play the Bach Partita, right? You all do it, you... Okay, all right, good, I got my finger in the right place. Y'all all heard me do that because it's amplified through the speaker. If you're doing that on acoustic, you can lay way back and nobody hears it. It didn't like that on an electric. The speaker picks up, look at, I bumped the violin. You do that on an acoustic, nobody hears it. Super forgiving. You do that on electric, it comes through 50,000 watts of PA and everybody goes, what the heck is that guy doing? Scratch. You know, the people who make, they're real scratchy players. I don't even know how to do it. All that scratch comes through. You know why? You got bad technique, okay? You have to learn how to play the instrument without making all that scratch. You gotta learn how to play the instrument without making all that thump. All the noises that you make is you're you know, bumping from string to string. All that gets amplified. On an acoustic violin, a lot of that gets hit. So um, to say that the electric violin is, is more forgiving is bunk. It is, it is forgiving in different ways, okay? And people will also say, well, there's natural built-in compression. Also not true. We actually measured this. I believed that it was true. I'd heard it so many times that I actually believed that it was true. And it was about uh, two or three months ago, we actually measured it. I brought in an acoustic and we set up a sound meter and I played real light and I played real loud. And there was, you know, maybe like a 30 dB difference. I did the same thing with electric. I hooked it up, played real quiet, played real loud. There was a 30 dB difference. The amount of dynamic range you have with an electric violin is the same as the dynamic range you have on an acoustic. The reason some of you feel like there's compression built into your electric violin is because of gain staging. If you're too close to the top of the gain stage in any of your pedals or your amps or your violin, then it, then it does introduce compression, okay? But if you are properly gain staged all the way through your system, you have just as much, um, you have just as much dynamic range as an acoustic does. And actually you have way more dynamic range than an acoustic does because you can use a volume pedal. The, an acoustic, when you play it, the very quietest you can play it, that's not zero dB. It's more like 60, okay? The quietest you can play is 60. The quietest I can play on an electric is essentially zero because I can rock a volume pedal all the way back. 
So you do have, you've got more dynamic range on an electric and they are less forgiving in certain ways than acoustics are. So myth dispelled, pow, myth Australia. All right, so while we're here, I'm gonna let you guys throw out some questions or if you've got any comments on why you enjoy having an electric in addition to your acoustic, um, I'd love to see those in the comments section. But while you're sort of typing those out, I want to show you an amp that we just got in. Uh, the YouTube people, you can all see this bad boy. It's the one I've been playing on. The Facebook people, it's right here at the bottom. It's the new Acoustic Image Double Shot. This thing is really cool. Acoustic Image is made right here in North Carolina. They don't even ship the amps to us. We drive over to their place and pick them up. That's how close they are. These are all handmade, hand-wired, point-to-point wiring inside here. Um, this is a... Um, well, depending on how you measure it, it's either 500 or 650 watts, whether we're talking RMS or peak, but it's, we'll say 500. It's a 500 watt head, two channels. Um, the cabinet is a five inch tweeter and two 10 inch, so there's a 10 on this side and a 10 on this side. So two 10 inch speakers and a five. This thing runs like a scalded dog. That's a country term right there. Um, the cabinet weighs about 15 pounds. The head weighs like three pounds, almost nothing. So if you don't have a roadie, um, this is a really nice little hat uh, system to have. I'm actually gonna take this out with me this weekend. I'm playing with a band that is loud. Um, I measured one time because I was curious when I played with these guys. It was 107 dB on stage during sound check. That's loud, buddy. So. Probably during a show, we're more like 110, 111 on stage. It is hot. So I'm gonna bring this little guy out and we're gonna see um, if uh, 18 pounds of horsepower here can keep up with these, uh, these big loud rock and roll country boys on stage. I'm supremely confident that it's gonna do really well. Uh, the other thing I like about this, it is super, super high def sound. Um, I'm gonna tell you guys a story. You guys want story time with Uncle Matt? Let's have story time. Um, I've got a buddy who's a bass player and he worked for, I'm not gonna name the company and I'm not gonna name him, but he worked for a bass amp company. Um, and he had all of the guitar centers east of the Mississippi. Okay, so he was off doing a clinic someplace and the, the head guy for the company called him and said, hey, we got a blues lawyer in this town where you're at. Y'all know what a blues lawyer is? Just a rich guy who buys really good stuff. Not necessarily a great player, but uh, got lots of money, so they buy good stuff. So this blues lawyer had bought uh, one of their amplifiers, a, a high-end amplifier, and he called in complaining that it didn't sound as good as his low-end amplifier that he had. So something's wrong with this thing, you know, a low-end amplifier sounds better than this high-end thing. So my buddy, they said, could you go to this guy's house and just check this amp out? Yeah, sure, no problem. So he goes to the guy's house, guy plays through the amp. Well, you're right, it sounds pretty bad. Uh, can you plug into your old amplifier? I wanna hear that. Plugs in the old amplifier. Well, you're right, the old amplifier sounds better than the new one. Uh, that's really weird, because one's very cheap and the other one's pretty nice. And my friend who's a professional player said, can, can I see your bass real quick? And he plugs into the nice amplifier with this guy's bass. You know what it sounded like? It sounded really nice. And he's like, oh, this is awkward. Um, and the guy sort of figured it out for him. He goes, it's not the amp, is it? I said, no, it's not the amp. He said, well, what happened? Why does, why does the good amp sound good with you and the bad amp sounds bad with you, but it's reversed for me? And my friend said, well, the problem is you've been playing through a crappy amp. You learned how to play through a crappy amp. So you have sort of adjusted your technique to, to make the best possible sound with that crappy amp. The problem is that's bad technique. So when you plug into an amp that actually amplifies what you're doing, it sounds bad because you're playing bad. It's not your fault. It's the amp that you were plugged into. You're plugged into a bad amp and you just kind of learn how to make it sound as good as it could. So the thing is a good amplifier, like this acoustic image, um, they're way less forgiving. If you're a good player, this thing's gonna sound amazing.
because it's going to amplify every last nuance of everything you do. If you're a bad player, this thing gives you nowhere to hide. There's no, uh, there's no like sort of, you can hear all the way around the edges with this amplifier. If you're using a cheap amplifier that doesn't really reproduce sound all the way, it can sort of smooth out some of your rough edges. And you go, well, you know, hey, I'm not that bad. And then you plug into something like this, and you're like, oh my goodness, I sound terrible. So the plus side of having a super high depth, super accurate amp, the plus side is it can hear every little thing that you're doing and amplify that. Minus side is it can hear every little thing you're doing and amplify that. So Corey Zillish is here. What's up, buddy? Um, so that's the nice thing about this amp. It sounds amazing. Of course, if I make a mistake, there's nowhere to hide because it isn't going to cover for me. And that's sort of the thing about high-end amps. But uh, yeah. Yes, Electric Violin Luthery makes a good point. Don't forget hearing protection. Um, I have been playing loud, 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 loud music for better than 30 years now. Um, I'm also a sound engineer. I have to be able to hear. So one of the reasons, and I've been tested, one of the reasons that I don't have a lot of hearing damage is because I have always used hearing protection on stage. Whether it's, whether it's earplugs in a super loud venue or I usually wear in-ear monitors when I'm touring with, with loud bands. Actually, at my church, I often stand right next to the drummer. He's coming up over his head with his hands when he's hitting. I've got some nice custom-fit in-ear monitors that I can barely hear the drums unless they're piped into my in-ears. So, yes, definitely wear hearing protection. Um, and then the other piece of that, too, is you can your ears can withstand a pretty high amount of sound for as long as you keep the duration in that sound uh, to a minimum. If you're doing like I was doing and you're doing a couple thousand shows every few years uh, and it's hours and hours and hours of each show that it's it's tens of thousands of hours in high volume environments, you gotta have hearing protection. You know, the concert that we did in Orlando last week, the concert's an hour and a half long, okay? I'm back running in front of house. I'm measuring the sound. We're in around 90 decibels. It's not that loud. But there's a lot of orchestra teachers freaking out. They see a drum kit. Oh my God, in my mind, it must be too loud. I had an orchestra teacher come to me going, my kids have to play tomorrow and their hearing is going to be blown out. No, it isn't. I'm measuring the amount of sound in here. I know how long you're going to be in this room. You're well within OSHA limits. And oh, by the way, I promise that your kids' video games are louder than this. So, yeah, we, we definitely want to protect your hearing, but have on my phone, I'm actually using my phone right now, but on my phone, I have a, a calibrated decibel meter. When I go into a place where I'm thinking, gosh, it's kind of loud in here, I can look and see how loud is it. I know what the OSHA standards are. Hey, I'm okay. If I'm, if I'm here for an hour or so, I'm fine. I don't have to worry about it. So, yeah, but hearing protection is, is a super, super important thing if you're going to be doing a lot of amplification. Absolutely. Um, any other comments that you guys have on why you might want an electric instrument, please dump those in the comments section and we'll reply to those as best we can. Um, in the next, I don't think it's this coming week, I think it's the following week, we've got some new violins in from Gava, G-E-W-A, from Gava. I'm a Gava, that's a Diva, sorry. Um, we have some new violins in from Gava, and the Gava folks are going to be here in this shop. Not on my nose. In this shop. They're going to be in this shop, and we're going to do a live stream with the people from Gava, with the new Gava violins. We've got them in. We like them. And, uh, yeah. And um, so that's, I think that's in two weeks. Um, next week, I don't know what we're talking about. If you guys have any suggestions, you can dump them in the comments section as well. Which decibel meter am I using? Okay, I'm actually using an RTA, a real-time analyzer, and it sums. Uh, if you guys don't know what an RTA is, this is actually a really cool talk. Um, an RTA is a readout. I'm going to show you on my hand. It's a readout. It shows you on, on one side will be high frequencies, on the other side is low frequencies, and it shows you how strong each frequency is. So if I, if I hum like a 440, like, woo, that's a little high. There we go. It'll actually, you'll see the little bar at 440 hertz, it'll pop up, right? Um, if I do a low frequency, 
the low frequency will push up. You high frequency, and I'm not doing that. The high frequency, you'll see that bar push up. So you can see how strong each frequency is in the room. Sound guys love these things. So we can sort of, we use our ears, but you want to visually confirm what your ears are hearing. And it's also quick, if you, if you hear some feedback, you'll see a bar jump up. And you can see that bar and you're like, oh, 3K. Let's notch that out. Okay, hear something and you're going to know. Um, but it's, it's also good to see and that's how you can kind of calibrate your ears. But even with that RTA, it has a sum that shows me and I can choose A weighted, C weighted, whatever. That'll tell me what the overall noise in the room is. Um, it's on my phone, but I've actually taken it and had it calibrated. So um, I know how loud the room I'm in is all the time. So um, anybody else have any questions? If not, I'm going to sign off. Um, that's why it's a good idea to have an electric violin. They can get quieter than acoustics. They can get louder than acoustics. They're more ergonomic than acoustics. Uh, you can use effects with them. Uh, so that you're not necessarily, your sound is dependent on the room that you're in. Uh, it's much easier to do extended range work on an electric than it is an acoustic. There's a wow factor, and I know it shouldn't matter, but it does. Um, and then, you know, we sort of address the myth that electric instruments are easier to play than acoustics. That's totally not true. Totally not true. Anybody who says that does not know what they're talking about. So, um, they're a little different. There are some things you don't have to, um, you don't have to dig in as hard to an electric and you shouldn't dig in as hard to an electric when you're trying to get louder. Um, but the dynamic range in an electric instrument is just as big or larger, believe it or not, than on an electric, on an acoustic violin. So, um, and basically because you can take more gigs, if you've got the ability to amplify, you can work more. And the more you can work, the more you can make and the more you can donate to orchestra programs like Corey Zillish's program or Rob Janoff's program because they deserve it. Okay, um, I guess with all this coronavirus thing, we're not shaking hands or kissing anymore. So uh, we're doing this. Peace. See you guys next week.